both talk a little bit about creating Walter because while he may be a little bit of a moral hodgepodge, he's not a bad guy. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think from the beginning, I I saw Walter, perhaps because I was writing this for Patrick, as as a hero of sorts. You know, Patrick has played heroes. Uh, I don't want to embarrass you, but I feel like he has a, a dignified and almost military bearing and stature. Um, and so as, as loony as Walter might be, he's well-intentioned. He's like mm -hmm. a Don Quixote. I mean, he's getting on his little horse with his, you know, lance mm -hmm. and going, I'm going forward, you know, we can make a difference in the world. I'm questing, you know, I'm chivalrous. So he's, uh, he might be deluded and, you know, the, of course, the famous thing of tilting at windmills, but he's tilting. And so I think that's what makes him a good person. He's not cynical, mm. you know. Um, so I think, yeah, he is a good person. I wanted him to be a hero, which is why I sort of came up with the idea, trying to imagine his backstory that, you know, it would make sense. He could have fought in the Falklands, you know, become disillusioned by that war, by any war, you know. And, mm -hmm. and so it was a soldier who, in a sense, became a pacifist. And, and it was through communication, through the pen, you know, that maybe he really could make a difference in a way that he wasn't able to as a soldier. So um, all this, I, to your question, is that he, I think, he is a good person, yeah. and he's well-intentioned. What was intriguing for me, and completely new in my experience, mm. was having the opportunity to um, talk about a character, investigate a character who as yet didn't exist. I've never been part of a process mm -hmm. where we went from nothing to this crazy, wacky, hopefully attractive guy. And the first few times that we met down in a coffee shop on Fifth Avenue in Brooklyn where we live, we both live nearby, um, what we largely talked about, which was intriguing for me, was our, our, our own lives and personal experiences. Um, I, I knew nothing about Jonathan, and he has had quite a colorful life uh, for such a young man. And, uh, and, and incidents in my life came up, and, and, and it was out of those conversations about who we were and how we had got here that began to build the structure, the found, at least the foundations of what became Walter Blunt and Blunt Talk. Yeah, and while he's a good person, he is also kind of like some of these old school journalists. He lives hard, mm, you know. He enjoys, yeah. enjoys booze. He, he he loves women, you know. So it's not like he's, uh, you know, a, 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 a monastic knight. You know, he's a he's a, a sensual knight. Yeah. So some of this stuff kind of gets him in trouble. It's me. I like to read into things, but I can see a lot of like homages to things there. Maybe mm -hmm. see a lot of network. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some cameos specifically by a young gentleman you've may worked with in the past that I won't leave unnamed as of right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, are all of these very specific, you know, points that you wanted to make, or am I just going a little too far? Oh, well, definitely. I mean, I like to draw upon my memory bank of cinema or images that appeal to me. So very much. Um, you know, we're referencing network. We call the, the network where Blunt Talk yep. appears UBS, which was the network where How Howard Beale in the film network, mm -hmm. he appeared. Uh, when we put Walter in front of his huge uh, poster, it's a little bit of a, a nod to Citizen Kane and Orson Welles in front of his Citizen Kane poster. Uh, and through, you know, in episode three, we have a dual between Walter and his manservant, yeah. which is a nod to Inspector Clouseau and Cato. So I like these things that have amused me or I thought were beautiful in film. We do little nods to them. Uh, I think for the viewer that notices, great. If they don't notice, it's a really fun image. And, and we're kind of putting it through our own filter. So we're not just lifting or trying to recreate, just sort of being inspired. I mean, most art is like that, you know. Yeah. Jonathan had, has a fascination with the, the history of movies, and uh, and when he talked about uh, using some iconic locations, which would reference uh, movies that we both loved or that had had an impact on our lives, I was charmed by that because when I first went to live in Los Angeles nearly 30 years ago, I was um, 
shocked by how much history there was there. I simply wasn't expecting it. I look on the new world as the new world. Mm -hmm. But I lived in Silver Lake, and to, to find that I was 10 minute walk away from the stairs that Laurel and Hardy mm -hmm. tried to carry the piano up was uh, amazing to me, because I'd seen that movie when I was a, when I was a kid, you know? And then we, we then pay homage to that staircase scene from the Laurel and Hardy film, uh, The Music Box. And we didn't, I wanted to shoot at the actual staircase, but it, it had changed a lot over uh. the years. So we found another beautiful staircase. But it, it was fun to, especially using Los Angeles to make allusions to these other films. And so that, you know, it could give pleasure to the audience on a number of levels. Like I said, for the people that will note these similarities. And, and there's so much more I want to tap into, like Echo Park Lake, that scene in Chinatown when Jack mm -hmm. Nicholson's in a rowboat. Um, but we, we had fun, you know, making these references once in a while.